Hey, Jenny Bradley here with Triangle Smart Divorce. This is Mark Wooten, an established mortgage, mortgage banker here in Cary, North Carolina with First Home Mortgage. And a lot of people going through divorce or thinking about getting married even have questions about mortgages, questions about homes, and those kinds of things. So I brought Mark in so I could ask him some of the questions that y'all ask us. Sure. Happy to help. Good morning, everybody. Here's a question we get a lot. I'm just going to jump right in. I'm pretend I'm a guy. I'm going through a I'm going through a divorce, and I just want to get the house sold, or she can have it. I don't care; it doesn't matter to me. But she's not been in the workforce in a number of years, so how can we put her in a position where she could get this mortgage and keep this house for our kids? Uh, that so that's a great question, and certainly a common uh, scenario. Essentially, from an underwriting perspective, the mortgage industry wants to understand her income such that we know she has the ability to repay the debt. Um, so in that scenario, we would want her to either A, rejoin the workforce in a capacity that is a full-time W-2 permanent job that is maybe in her previous field of study. Um, if not, there may need to be a six month or so uh, amount of time that elapses uh, for her to use that income for qualifying. And then secondly, um, if she is getting any type of child support, alimony, things of that nature, we're going to want to document that with a court order plus six months of payments from the ex. And then those two income amounts combined should help her qualify for a new mortgage. All right. And when we were talking about this a little bit off camera before we got started, I said, Mark, can it be just in a court, in a, in a agreement? Because a lot of times we'll do an agreement that's notarized that both parties sign that we lawyers say is a legally binding document. And you said, no, the mortgage industry really is looking for a court order. A divorce decree. That's right. Something that's agreed upon by all parties and then signed off on by a judge. Okay. So... Still can be an agreement. We don't have to go to court and knock down, drag out the fight and all that stuff, but it's got to have that judge's signature on it for your, your industry. That's right. Okay. Well, I think that's an important distinction because here at Trying to Smart Divorce, we've worked a lot of things out by consent and by agreement. And sometimes people don't even have a judge involved in their case till the final divorce. That's right. That was a good one I learned today, even yeah. that when we start getting pushback from mortgage brokers we've been dealing with, that's why. Because you have regulations you have to adhere to. Sure. In order to write the loan. Yeah, I mean, the reality is in that scenario, if it's not court ordered and for whatever reason, the other spouse doesn't comply, we don't really have the ability to enforce something because what they bound themselves to on a contract, a uh, legal document, maybe at some point you can make that occur uh, as far as call, 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 forcing them to comply, but it could be years. And maybe what ends up happening is it gets watered down um, and the new amount is totally different than what was originally agreed upon and what the judge signs off on is a, is a number that doesn't yeah. work. Let's flip it a little bit. Let's say you and I, this is really flipping it now, you and I are married and we're going through a divorce. We both have our jobs. We have our own careers. And, and both of us just want to get rid of that house and start over, downsize maybe. Both we get something smaller or maybe we don't want to live where we were living together or whatever. If you're selling that house, um, what is qualifying qualifying? Is what you said earlier the same? Or is there something else that we need if we're selling a house and then buying new houses? If we're selling our house and then each of us intend to go out and purchase something new, the first thing I would recommend is a free trade agreement, which yeah. you're probably familiar with. And that essentially gives both of us an opportunity to legally buy without the other person having a right to the property. Um, and then secondly, because that old house has now been disposed of, there's no debt associated with that that either of us would carry into our new mortgage. As a result, it would be a matter of how much do each of us make? What's the new payment on the house that we want to purchase? And then maybe second, if there's income from an alimony or child support perspective that will, that needs to be used for qualifying, has that income stream been made for six months? Can we document that? If the answer is yes, you would qualify just no differently than anyone else in a traditional fashion. Okay. Well, let's say that you wanted to keep the house and you wanted to say, here, Jenny, here's some money for your share of the equity in the house. But you have to refinance because I'm sure. on the mortgage. Right. 
Um, and that's a requirement under this consent order that we were talking about earlier. Does that count against you as a debt when you are looking to refinance? So I, you owe me a hundred thousand dollars. Let's say I would, I would refinance and cash out is what I think I'm understanding the question to be. I would cash out a hundred thousand dollars, give you that money. And then you would quick claim your interest over to me mm -hmm. such that I am the only owner of the old residence. And then you would be free to go use that hundred thousand to put towards a new mortgage. And then for you on the refinance, does the payment to me of a hundred, how does that affect what loan you can get or, or anything else? Is it different that you're paying me versus taking money out and paying off the car loan and the credit card debt? Well, actually there's a, there's a loophole that allows me to call my refinance a rate and term refinance versus a cash out. So traditionally a cash out refinance has more risk. And because of that, the rates adjusted higher. So if I'm cashing out for the purpose of consolidating debt, credit cards, car loans, et cetera, I may pay about three eighths more in rate than I would pay if a court is mandating me to give you $100,000. So in that scenario, I'm able to utilize a rate and term refinance, which is going to give me a lower interest rate. So absolutely, I would prefer if I'm having to pay you out to be able to use that court document to demonstrate to my mortgage underwriter that I am forced to do so. And as a result, it's a rate and term. And for math, three eighths of a point. I know what it means and you know what it means. And maybe everybody watching this video knows what it means, but let's say it's a $500,000 mortgage over 30 years. How does that affect your payment? Well, you know, just in the form of straight interest, uh, year one, it's going to be about $1,800. So I'm saving $1,800 a month in interest. Now, obviously, over time, that starts to get lower. Um, so I would say that starting out, it's probably in the $130, $135 a month range that using that strategy would save me versus having to call my loan to cash out. Or doing what we see a lot of people do, which is to say, I'll take the house, I'll take the equity, I'll take the loan, and I'll take all this credit card debt and pay it. Right. Right. And so then they have that debt on their side of the ledger when you're looking at them and they do cash out and they take pay off the debt. Sure. Smarter to do cash out to your ex-spouse and they can use that money to pay debt. Correct. Through the court order. Through the court order. Yes. Correct. Exactly. Through the court order. Because if you don't do it through the court order... Candidly, we live in a day and age where you can't trust people to do what they promise. Right. So you need it in the court order and the bank needs it in the court order. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's a good tip. That could help someone qualify for mortgage they wouldn't otherwise have qualified for if you could drop their payment by a couple hundred bucks or, you know, 135, 150, whatever your exact number was there. No doubt. So not to date this conversation too much, but it's 2024. Rates are elevated. We see people all the time that 100 to $150 a month is the difference between them getting a mortgage or they continue to not be able to qualify. So this one little tweak might be what allows both parties to move off. No, that's a good one. And, you know, as I said earlier, I was this many days old when I learned that little loophole. Yeah. So yeah. that was worth the price of admission for me, Mark. Oh, that, wonderful. <laughs> all right. So... Anything else that you'd want to tell us divorce lawyers, we could be doing better to help our clients help you be able to put them in a mortgage. Well, you know, because I, I bet you've seen it all. Yeah. You know, it's, it's crazy. We, you can never get surprised anymore with what goes down uh, in that, in that environment. But the biggest thing I would say is life's already stressful enough. And if you're going through a life event such as that, if kids are involved, it's worse, but regardless of stressful, um, so many questions people have that go unanswered or that build stress unnecessarily is probably something that we should try to avoid together. So I would suggest that they get in touch with someone, understand financially what they can and can't do from a mortgage perspective, and then work together. Like you've decided that you're getting divorced. That piece is behind you. How do you move on? How do you not continue to hurt each other? And in my mind, the way that you do that is you get on the same page about how to exit the relationship in the most financially feasible way. And you're going to need the resources of a mortgage professional to guide you through that. I mean, routinely, I help both parties 
Um, you know, sometimes that's not possible because there's just zero conversation uh, between the couples. But in a perfect world, if we can have an open discussion as to why trust gets built and everybody can move forward more easily. No, I think that's great. And that really resonates with what we try to do here, which is to help people build their new future with less stress, less headache, less animosity. Because at the end of the day, if you do have kids together, you know, you're still their parents, whether you decide to be together or not. And if you don't have kids together, you want to have a more healthy, happy, adjusted life moving forward, rather than staying in anger and frustration and such. And I think that's great. I wish that more people would sometimes even come see you before they decide to get divorced. Sure. And see what their options are, right? Yeah. It's more expensive sometimes to get divorced, obviously, right? We have been known to say a phrase like it's cheaper to keep him or her right. than it is to get divorced financially. Correct. But emotionally, sometimes it's what you got to do because sure. the emotional toll was costing you more healthy healthiness and happiness than the finances are. Sure, sure. Well, thanks for joining me, Mark. That was really super and insightful and I think helpful for everybody that at least are my clients. You know what? I, I appreciate the opportunity. This has been a ton of fun. Um, anything that we can do to help your clients, please uh, share my contact info. Happy to be a resource in that regard. And, um, you know, obviously it's not ideal to get divorced, but when you do, let's keep it simple. Let's make it as easy for all parties to go forward as possible. That's great. We'll drop it in the bottom, how people can find you there at First Home Mortgage. Perfect. Thanks so much.